everybody, to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are happy to be here, and we are, as always, happy to have you with us. Getting together, share a beer, have some conversation, maybe learn some new things, as we do sometimes. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I am Tim Dennis, Brian Hewitt. How are you doing, sir? I am doing great, Tim. Uh, and we've got with us Sarah Kelly, the marketing manager for Season Brand. We're going to talk about tin fish and beer and other things, but a lot of tin fish and beer, Tim. That is what's going to happen. We are. We are, yeah. definitely. And you know what? Producer extraordinaire Mo Mike Nate is hanging out there. Nate, Absolutely. you had to step up last week, didn't you? I did. It was a lot of fun. It was yeah. a little honest, but I think we managed to create a good, uh, well-listened show. We good, did all right. Good. Yeah, from producer to co-host, it's a, it's a big jump. It's a lot of responsibility. Nate. It is. So, Sarah, how the heck are you today? I am good. Happy Wednesday to all of you. And thank you so much again for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're glad to have you here. We have been, we've been, enjoy- I think we're, we're newbies, Sarah, fairly much to this. Now I, I would say in childhood, I think everybody's had tuna, you know, no one, no one gets squeamish at a can of tuna. It's that's some tuna salad and that. And my dad really liked kippers. He ate kippers a lot. So as a kid, we always had kippers in the house. So I, I enjoyed those. And in my teens, for some reason, I got into smoked oysters, but that's it. That's, that was my 10 seafood, uh, except for like mom's uh, salmon patties. That was my 10 seafood and probably till year or so ago. So, you know, we're new in this. We, we've jumped on the bandwagon and the trend. So we're, we're looking forward to chatting with you and, uh, you know, learning more about that, learning about pairing some beer and tins and the types of tins and really just educating folks on 10 seafood there but before we roll into that let's get to our beers of the week and talk about since we're doing a little different structure this week brian what are you sipping on this week yeah so my pregame was a uh, sweetwater american lager and uh you know shout out to sweetwater they sent us a nice care package full of fun beers and that was i had a can of that in there and i thought that would be a great way to start things off it seemed like the kind of beer that i would open up if i were eating some tin fish so i had that it was it was nice and refreshing I am currently working on an Anchor Steam beer, my last one of them in a bottle. It's uh, based on the... For now. As a result, yeah, yeah, for mm-hmm. now, for now. You know, More on that some, later. Yeah, we got some news about that. There's a reason for me drinking that this week. And uh, later on, I may get into a Fairhope Brewing Willie Mays Haze, a hazy IPA I picked up in Fairhope, Alabama okay. when I was down there. So uh, that's what I've got going on, Tim. Uh, how, how about you? So I picked out something specifically for our our fish show, something that I think would would pair really nice with a nice seacuterie board here. Mm. I have I'm going to say this name wrong because I don't speak the freaky deaky Dutch, but it's Brasserie de Blauges, Blauges, it's B-L-A-U-G-I-E-S. But that's a collaboration with Hill Farmstead Brewery out of Vermont. And this is called La Vermontois. And oh yeah, Sarah. Appropriately, the style on this one is a saison. So I've got a saison here to pair with season, pin fish, and that. And this is really nice. Well, I was a little scared, Brian. I was a little scared because the description says substantial bitterness, and it's dry and subtle lemony finish. I don't get substantial bitterness, and you know, with me, that's totally, totally all right. So, Sarah, yeah. do you have a frosty beverage this evening? I do. So I'm actually right now I'm drinking Magnify Brewings, their main event, New England style IPA. But Very a Saison cool. is perfect. And honestly, right? yeah. I didn't even think about the closest between it's, Saison and Season. You yep. would think I would get it. But having you say it right now, I mean, how obvious is that, right? I have a lot of things like that. Like you, you see it mentioned or something and it just doesn't click until one time, you know, somebody says it and you're like, oh, right. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Good stuff. Oh, Nate, what you sipping on? So I'm actually going dry this month. I know it's a shock to you guys because I didn't uh, give you any warning. So I'm drinking ginger beer. Uh, I know it's okay. non-alcoholic, but it's got beer in the title. And so it would fit in. Dry January here, right? What would you, what would you, is there a, a seafood that would pair well with a ginger beer? Because I that never even crossed my mind. Like ginger seems like it might with something. I, I would absolutely guy. think so. I mean, you know, if you think about sushi, you have ginger on the side. That's so, a good point. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think that could totally pair well with I would say probably just the bread and butter for us, our skinless and boneless sardines. There you go. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, and you know, honestly, I I think probably just about any. Like you said, you go yeah. with su- ginger, 
Ginger's a palate cleanser. So you're just going to have a fresh palate every. So there now we're going to tell you, Sarah, we're going to we're going to we're going to expose Nate right now. Nate has never and will never eat a tin of fish. <laughs> yeah. Correct. So that's that's not going to happen. He's a he's a picky eater and fish are not on the menu. But Brian, and I usually eat enough to make up for it. though, So we'll be OK. Awesome. And you know what? We always say it's not for everyone, but I feel like at least if you try, if you try fish, it's not for you. But for a lot of people, they just need to try it. They don't, they have this conception in their mind, you know, is it smelly? Is it stinky? Is it a, you know, fish in the can with the bones and the tails, but just try it because you might like it. But of course there are people out there who don't, my husband is one of them. So I totally understand. No worries there. Yeah. So Sarah, it, for those on the live stream, you can probably see it. Is that your stash behind you there on the shelf? Is that is that a bunch of tens? It is. And to be honest with you, I would have loved to have cleaned it up before I hopped on this podcast. No, I think I it's great it, there. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fitting. So, you know, we do a lot of product research, uh, market research, a lot of testing. Um, actually, just yesterday, we met with another supplier for some other um, types of tin fish that we don't currently sell. So um, I have a lot of samples. It's kind of have like I have a mini warehouse in my house, but I always have a stock on hand and it keeps it fun. Good stuff. There's a, I think is, is I recognize Tenvy a few of those boxes. Tenvy, maybe we Tenvy. should coin that that phrase. Tenvy, there, so having that there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Sarah, I tell you what, we're gonna as beer guys, of course. You know, we 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 have some people. We've actually had a few of our listeners that have reached out and said, "All right, guys, you got me. I'm trying. I picked up some tens at the store today." You know, I'm checking them out. But if someone is just getting ready to explore and there is stigma, especially in the U.S. with tents, you know, so if you you say sardines, you see TV shows, cartoons, whatever, they're the poor, the broke, the dejected are the ones eating sardines. But if you're just coming to sardines, how are you going to sell someone to try some sardines or some tin fish? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, for us, our number one selling skew is our skinless and boneless sardines and olive oil. And what people don't realize is it's actually a beautiful filet of fish. Again, no skin, no bones. It's very mild. It's really like tuna, but better. That's what kind of like we like to say. And the great thing about the skinless and boneless sardines and olive oil is that it has four times more omegas than tuna. We love tuna. Don't get me wrong. But it's nice to have something that's a little bit healthier. It has 22 grams of protein per serving. Um, it's very, very low in mercury and other contaminants because it's such a small fish versus tuna is a larger fish. So, you know, it's just a great addition. And there's so many different ways to prepare it. So instead of making a tuna salad sandwich, you actually could make a sardine salad sandwich. You, For me, what I like to do, um, I actually put sardines on my salads. I have that for lunch a lot. Um, You can have them on top of crackers when you get home from work and you're tired and you're hungry. You want to crack open a beer and you just want to have like a nice, quick protein hit. Just crack open a can of sardines and it's a great way to try it. So I actually had a tin of your boneless, skinless sardines and olive oil with a salad for lunch today, paired with some garlic, roasted garlic triscuits. And it made for a fantastic lunch. Now, so sometimes I put mine on the salad. With this one, I took some uh, Tabasco green hot sauce, dashed it into the tin and just ate it as kind of a a side to my salad there. But great meal. You know, get my omega-3s. You got to do it. It's a great way to do that. So, Absolutely. And it's shelf stable. So it's a great pantry item to just load up and have in your cupboard. You don't have to worry about preparing. You don't have to worry about refrigerating. They last for about four years. So we do a lot of really great business on Amazon. People will buy them by the case and just you know, keep them in their pantries for when they need them. So I was going to talk about this later, but since you mentioned talking, you mentioned that they last for about four years. I have seen on various discussion forums, vintage sardines, you know, and going back and actually there's a very popular um, uh, website uh, for purchasing rainbow tomato, tomatoes garden. I'm sure you're familiar with them, you know, with the sardine world, but um, uh, they had, they sell some vintage tins and I got some, 2017 and 2018 they were french and tried those and i'm going to say and you know in beer we do we sell our beers as well you know there's certain beers especially like these saisons and that we can put them back but uh, i tried the 2017 and the 2018 and i gotta say 2017 i think it went too far sarah i don't think they were as good as the 2018s but so because technically speaking a, a sealed tin of fish 
unless it's punctured damage or something, you could technically safely eat that 20 years from now, correct? Yeah, yeah, you can eat it for quite a long time. Um, you know, for us, of course, we have to put the best by dates right. um, just mm-hmm. for safety reasons. But, you know, typically, I would say, really, it's best to enjoy a can of sardines after the first maybe like two or three years because it has time to actually marinate, especially when it's in that olive oil. It really tastes delicious um, versus when you have one right off the production line. Yeah, so maybe what, what, 2017. Yeah. It's a little bit too far back. <laughs> so, so the it big attraction, good. Good. the big attraction to the the vintage tin. I've never had one myself. Is that it? Just it's the marination, the the marriage of flavors. Is that really what it is, or does the fish itself kind of soften or change in some way, flavor wise? Uh, anybody who's had one, you know, I don't know. I think it's a little bit of both. I think really it's just the fact that it's marinating in that oil for so long. It takes on a different, um, a little bit of a different flavor. And it's the novelty aspect, too, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I can just tell you from my own experience, Brian, that it was it did feel like the oil was more penetrated through the entire fish, like the the fish was richer. It wasn't mushy, but it was soft. And the flavor of both the oil and the fish were just very cohesive. So it they were nice. I encourage you, Brian. I know you like vintage beers. So uh, jump out there and get you some vintage tins and see what's up. I may have to look into that. I have noticed that opening some tins and a lot of times I'll eat them directly from the tin, especially if it's something new and I want to see what it actually tastes like on its own. I'll notice that uh, the ones on the top, if you have those, they might be a little on the drier side. You're like, yeah, this is a little dry. The thing is, is the oil isn't covering the the very, very top part. It's it's hitting the tin. So you're not getting that. But I would imagine with time it would get into that because of, uh, you know, the proximity and the absorption and that sort of thing so if you dunk them again i've noticed oh like this is a lot better if you coat it in the oil inside of it and then eat it so that makes sense to me uh i could i could definitely see that and depending on everything else in the tin uh the the oil plus the other possible spices that they sometimes put in the tins it could be really really uh impressive over time yeah i can imagine stuff so sarah we've seen a lot of descriptors for sardines and I'll expand on this, but my question in essence is what are sardines? And then we've seen like pilchard, sprat, bristling, all this. I've seen some that you'll look at the ingredients on the tin and it says contains herring, you know? So it sounds like there's a bit of a broad definition on exactly what a sardine is. Yeah, absolutely. And it really kind of depends on which part of the world the the fish is coming from. So all sardines are smaller fish. Um, You know, as you mentioned, you could have a pilchard sardine, you can have bristling, um, you can have sprats. The pilchard is coming from um, more of the Moroccan area. We source our fish from uh, the North Atlantic Ocean in Morocco. Um, Could be from Spain, could be from Portugal, kind of in that neck of the woods. Um, The bristling sardine is more of a cold water fish. So that's coming from up north. So for us, we source our bristlings from Latvia, um, sprats are very similar. They're a little bit smaller typically. And with bristling, they can be packed in different ways. Like for example, we have, um, bristlings that are packed two layers in the can, one layer, um, a beautiful cross pack, um, just depending on the size of the, of the fillets themselves. So it really just kind of depends, I would say where they're coming from, but there's over 50 types of sardines. So there's actually a lot and they're kind of lumped into one big category. I had no idea. I thought sardine was a, a single type of fish that just happened to be everywhere. So in, in reality, you're just when you get sardines, you need to look at the region they're coming from. And that'll tell you what kind of fish you're getting, not just the terroir of the fish, but the actual species of the fish. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And for us, we actually on the back of all of our packaging, we sort we list where we're sourcing the fish from and what species of fish it is just for fish education, because, again, a lot of people don't know. Yeah, it's a, I tell you, it's, it's something I'm big about. Anytime I get into something, Sarah, I nerd out way more than I should. And I guarantee we've got people that have listened to this as a beer show and they're like, are these guys really talking about tens of fish again? Yes. Yes, we are. But we're going to get beer here in just a second. So it's something that's, and you know what? This is something that's good. You can grab a tin, you can get a beer and, and kick back. And, you know, on that note, Sarah, let's talk a little bit. Let's say I'm going out and I just have, I got a basic tin of sardines and I'm going to crack them open. And let's say I don't have anything. I got some saltine crackers. So I've got a 
tin of sardines and some saltine crackers. What beer is going to pair well with that? So the Saison, like you said, would be great. Um, I actually really like a cream ale or any sort of um, citrusy pale ale. So I, anything that's really going to cut that oiliness from the fish would be great. Um, you want something light. You want something that is going to just pair nicely and not overpower the palate. Um, I would say also a Pilsner or a Belgian wheat would be nice. Um, those are just some preliminary suggestions. But for me, I'm actually, like I said, drinking an IPA. I had some sardines before, and I find that to be really great as well. It's nice and citrusy and light, so it's good for summer. Yeah, I think we're pretty ver- – you know, I would say that probably – for most fish, maybe some smoked. Maybe if you had something kind of heavily smoked, like a kipper or something, you could go with like a robust porter or a brown ale. But I would say yeah. in general, if you're just talking basic sardines, those probably wouldn't pair well. Pair well, but you do have a broad range, like we talked about the the saisons. I think that's going to be you know a great pairing there. A pell ale, a pilsner. You know, there's I think there's some versatility there, a little breadth in what you can do with that. So. And you know what? I think if I had a tin of oysters, that I could definitely break out a nice porter or something to pair with that. And I definitely think that, that would yeah. go absolutely, right. absolutely. So. That's one fish that we don't have currently, but All now right. that you well, mentioned it, you've given us see? ideas. Yeah. See, I knew oyster I heard stouts, you, man. That's I a heard thing. You t- yeah, for sure. You know, you mentioned when we were talking that you were talking to some companies about uh, carrying some other items that you don't. Anything you can share with us at, at what the future is looking like for season? Yeah, so I can't share anything specific right now just because it's too soon, but I would say, you know, for us, we're really looking to branch out as a canned fish company. Um, We've been in business for over 100 years. We actually started in the Northeast in 1921. So, you know, we're doing really well. We're the number one premium uh, skinless and boneless sardine product on the market nationally. So, you know, we carry the sardines, mackerel, anchovies, kippers, we have a vegan caviar, but as you mentioned, oysters, mussels, um, trout, those are all things that we don't currently carry. And we're just really looking to um, expand our portfolio to see what makes sense as a complimentary item for us. Good stuff. You know, Sarah, I, I doubled down. I was doing my homework today. I've been eating season 10 since. Uh, yeah. And thank you. We got a, a sampler from you there with some great tins in it. But I had caviar for breakfast this morning. So, Did you? I, yes, yes. I toasted up a bagel and some cream cheese, and I made some French style scrambled eggs, and uh, you know, paired it up there. I, I enjoy. It was, you know what? It was fun. I'm gonna say it was fun. And th- I will say the one thing: if you try this and you're you you know caviar, it doesn't quite have the same pop as like the actual caviar eggs do. But uh, you know the brininess there. It went. Brian wants to say something. Just a second, Brian. He's trying. But uh, went very nice on a toasted bagel with cream cheese, and it went very nice with my scrambled eggs as well. So it made for a pretty nice breakfast. That's awesome to hear. So, the, so the, bre- the 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 product is caviar. I looked into that. What is caviar? You mentioned it's vegan, and well, it, caviar I know is not vegan technically. So, yes. what is caviar? So they're actually made out of black um, seaweed pearls. It's a proprietary process there. Um, the seaweed that makes up these pearls is grown in France and it's harvested in Denmark and produced there. Um, it was actually invented by a chef. And for us, we actually sourced um, a traditional caviar product prior a few years ago and the fish actually dried up. We weren't able to source it any longer. So oh, that's wow. why we were looking for an alternative. And this product has been doing so well for us, as we all know, you know, the vegan um, and plant-based consumer base is growing really heavily. So we've been able to sell this product into Walmart. It's um, sold national across the country. It's on Amazon, but it's just a really great um, shelf stable alternative to traditional caviar. And it's completely sustainable. There's no cruelty involved. And I think Tim, to your point, it doesn't quite have that pop, but it still gives you that brininess. And it, I think it does, it's a nice yeah. way to introduce people into caviar because it's a little bit less scary than having fish eggs. Yeah. And I saw some people comment on it that they said that, that, you know, they said they were vegan or they had vegan friends and they're like, look, I can do an hors d'oeuvre party and I can make something that my vegan friends can eat. Not only is it vegan safe, but they think it's cool because it's, you know, something different. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, I can have caviar here. So, you know, pretty, pretty cool. Like I said, it's uh, 
You know, it's not exactly fish eggs, but you have the brininess, you have the, you know, the small pearls. That's you know, just the texture to me of caviar is, is nice. So it was, it was, it was fun. I had a good time. With, I had a good time hanging out with caviar. <laughs> Awesome good stuff, Brian. It's good stuff, but I'll have to try it out. It's that's yeah, intriguing you have to, to me. check it out. So we were talking about another one. This is one of my favorite. What's your favorite tin, Sarah? What are you? What's your go to? So it's funny that you asked that question because Brian, I saw you holding up a can of the grilled mackerel, and I was just going to comment. That's my absolute favorite. I love it. So for me, I actually wasn't a tin fish eater prior to coming to this company. Mm -hmm. And I was like a lot of people out there that said, "Mm, sardines, you know, I've had tuna. I love tuna. I like seafood, but I'm not quite sure. So um, the grilled mackerel was actually great because it has that grilled um, flavor to it. So it kind of is a great way to like introduce yourself into different types of tin fish. I call it the gateway fish. Um, And it's very meaty. It's just like tuna. It's mild. And so I started eating the grilled mackerel and then slowly but surely I ventured onto sardines with this, the skinless and boneless, then the bone in. So that was actually my first favorite product of season. And it's still my favorite today. They're very approachable. I, that's the one thing that when I started was just starting with the, uh, the tin fish after a long period of not having hardly any seafood at all, really. The, the mackerel was a nice place to start because it is so mild. It is meaty and it, a tuna fish sa- sandwich yeah. it could be a mackerel sandwich it's it just it's perfectly for that and i as i've gone along i really i think i prefer sardines with skin and bones and the, the little extra funk that gives i'm like i want my fish to be a little on the funky side but this is a, a, the mackerel is a really safe easy convenient place yeah. to start you know not offensive i think you, you can get you could get by with it in the place of like a chicken and chicken salad or anything else where you would make it i think people would not be repelled by it so you know even probably the most squeamish of folks yeah i would think yeah absolutely i I always recommend mackerel and kippers as good gateway like hey if you like tuna if you like fish in general and you're not ready to jump into a a whole fish grab you some grab you some filet mackerel grab you some kippers you know check that out absolutely sarah i don't know exactly how or why it happened and to be honest i guess it happening is the reason that i got more interested in it but and fish is trendy now. It's it TikTok trendy. And that's weird, Sarah. That's weird that 10 fish is TikTok trendy. But I was looking at your social media today and there was a nice recipe on there where she made a nice salad. She made a sauce with some garlic and things. And she heated her tin a little bit in um, uh, in the pan with some lemon and made just this really nice plate. But it, it it's trendy now. Why? Why? Do you, do you have any idea where the source is here? Yeah, well, I think a lot of this goes back to the pandemic when people were looking for, you know, protein sources to stock up on. And, you know, TikTok obviously really exploded around that time. Girl dinner exploded around that time. So I think it was just a combination of all those factors and people sharing, you know, different recipes of shelf stable proteins. And Tinfish just really took off. I know there's um, Chef Allie Hook. She started Tin Fish Date Night, and she shares a bunch of um, secoutry boards that she has with her husband, and she features a lot of types of sardines, mackerel, all that good stuff. So I think people are curious about it because I think, to your point, people wouldn't expect Tin Fish to be so popular. Right. And even for me, I was kind of like, wow, you know, it's great for us, but you just wouldn't expect it. Um, so I think it's just been a lot of buzz and a lot of people realizing the health benefits as well. Because prior, you know, people would say, again, ew, sardines, I don't know. Is it smelly? Is it a, you know, cold dead fish in a can? But then once you start explaining, well, you can have it, you know, in a recipe, in a secuterie board. Um, It has tons of omegas. It has tons of protein. If you eat one can, like that can, Brian, that you held up, you will be full, honestly. So I think TikTok is just a great way to spread the spread the word and just get more information. Now I I I know some of it's the uh, the oil that's in there but it's for it's 4.375 ounces so that's that's the size of a, a, a like a small cut of steak basically so it 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 is substantial when I eat these I notice it very quickly other things you yeah. eat take a while to to register the tins register very quickly I every now and then I'll get gluttonous and I'll eat two and I'm like yeah I probably shouldn't have had both especially if you're eating anything else but I tell you what I one thing for me, honestly, is a convenience factor. That's a huge thing yeah. for me with this that I can uh, 
like I said, you know what? Super lazy at lunch day. I was busy. I ordered a salad from Subway and not a fan of Subway sandwiches, but they can actually throw a decent salad together with all those veggies they've got. there. So I got a salad. I cracked a tin open. Boom. I've, I've got lunch there. You know, it, it's that simple for dinner. I can, you know, make some pasta and open up some razor clams and I cook some noodles. I throw in some razor clams, butter, lemon, garlic, and uh, throw some parmesan in there. And I have a fancy pants pasta dish in the 10 minutes it takes me to cook noodles, you know. So it's 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 nice. I mean, it's nice, the convenience there. So bringing this back around, if someone wants to do, we've used secuterie a couple times here. And of course, that's a charcuterie board made with various tins and that. If you were bringing over some friends and you were planning to do like secuterie and beer, and we'll say drinks as well, what would you put together, Sarah? You mean from the whole board in general? Or yeah, from like what are some of your, what are some of the accoutrements that you like to throw into your secuterie board? Yeah, definitely. So I would say, you know, any types of like pickled vegetables would pair really nicely. Obviously crackers, fresh bread, like a French bread cut up would be really great. Um, I love having like Dijon mustard, you know, just to spread on there as well. Um, Harissa sauce pairs really nicely or any sort of like sriracha um, or like a Tabasco sauce if you wanted to add that with tinned fish. Um, You know, as I said before, from a drink standpoint, any type of Pilsner, Saison, Kolsch, um, an IPA or an American Pale Ale. Um, from the wine standpoint, if you were going to go that route, um, I would say, again, any sort of like Pinot Grigio, something just light, um, a Moscato, especially for the summer. So I think there's a lot of different things you could do. Olives would be nice on the board. You really, there's no set formula for it, for it but um, that's probably what I would think right off the bat. Ron, I think one time at the studio, you and I were trying to be fancy. We cracked open some tins and a bottle of Prosecco with uh, some aged yeah. Gouda one time. So, and that's, you know, not our not our typical evening, but uh, we threw our pinkies up and threw back that Prosecco. And that was really nice. Yeah. Was that the time? That wasn't the time that we had the anchovies that turned out to be way entirely too much. That was not, So we're, again, Sarah, we're just ex- exploring some of this. And uh, I had seen some people talk about anchovies. We went to a nice uh, place here called Straw, Star Provision. Shout out to them. Great little shop there. But we just grabbed a tin of anchovies. And uh, Brian, I tell you what, you've had anchovies again recently. Those were a lot more intense back then than what we've had now, right? Yeah. Sarah, they were- I don't know. I don't know what we got our hands on, but we literally took them out and threw them on a cracker and it about knocked us out of our chair. It was, <laughs> I don't know what we did, but like, I really enjoy now um, getting a tin of sardine or excuse me, a tin of the anchovy fillets and I'll take some ciabatta and brush it with olive oil and actually some of the tin oil off the anchovies. And I toast mm-hmm. that up really nice. And then I'll put on, um, banana peppers like pickled banana pepper rings red onion and then you only need a couple like you can have a big slice of ciabatta but you're only going to need a couple anchovies but that's Mm -hmm. stellar i mean that that's gourmet stuff there and so easy i mean easy yeah yeah how could you mess that up that's right it's true i think for for anchovies you know typically especially for someone who's new to it i would say you would want to try it in a recipe first you know like in a caesar salad or on pizza, just to kind of cut that saltiness. I love anchovies, but I think sparing is the key. Like they're quickly too much of a good thing. Uh, And I don't, I can't think of anything that's quite that at that level. Like maybe just salt in general. Like I like salt, but like a handful of salt is too much salt. So it's, it's kind of like that, like as a, almost as a seasoning is the way I think of it. Or Mm -hmm. like if you, if it's soft enough, you can spread it across some bread and, you got the butter and everything else to balance it out with. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, That's why when you get pizza with anchovies, like if you see it, it's one anchovy on a slice. It's not. That's it. That's all you need on there to totally, you know, give you every bit of anchovy you need on that is just one little filet is going to be plenty for you. So, hey, you know what? I, do you ever put hot sauce on your uh, on your tins? Because I I've gotten more into hot sauces as a result of tin seafood. And I have opinions about various hot sauces now, whereas I really didn't have much of an opinion before. I had a couple and now I experiment a fair amount. Is that is that do you as well? Yeah. So we actually do have um, an item that has Louisiana hot sauce. So it does really well for us. I believe we sell that in most Walmart stores. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just, it's one of those things where it's an acquired taste. It's either you love the hot sauce with it or you don't. But even if, you know, you were to purchase our sardines in water or an oil, you could always add the hot sauce to it and then add the amount that you'd like. That makes sense. Easy and, and peasy, I guess, right? Easy peasy. And the one I recommend everybody who's trying tins out to try is uh, green Tabasco is just an obvious easy one. I think it goes with most everything, but but Frank's with dill. Dill Frank's with the dill uh, pepper. Uh, what do you call it? It's, it's dill pickle. seasoning. It's just a, it's a yeah, it's dill, like a dill pickle pickle flavored Frank's. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic on, on any kind of seafood. If, if it's boring, you know, Frank's, if it's, if it's good, still Frank's is like, it's, it's amazing with that dill in it. Frank's by itself is good. Frank's with dill is a, just a whole nother level. So yeah. Another recommend level. That. Yeah. So Sarah, one more question for you. Then we'll get a little info where people can get more info. Um, cooking in tins. That's something I've seen just recently. And one I saw was, uh, I forget what they call it. They call it like low rent oysters, Rockefeller or something like that. But, you know, you put your pad of butters in there, you throw some onions, some garlic, and you throw it in a toaster oven and boom. So do you do any cooking in tins? Do you have any suggestions for things to try there? Yeah. So I would say um, the pasta. I mean, I don't cook. I take everything out of the can. Okay. And I'll just, like you said, make the pasta and I'll throw right, throw the sardines right on top. Um, I haven't ventured too much into cooking in the tin, but that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I did. I did try the, uh, you know, the podunk oysters Rockefeller, we'll call it there. And it was pretty good. Like I, t- I So I cheat a little bit. Some of them just do the stuff in the tin. I put mine in a saucepan with a little bit of cream and butter and Parmesan and some spinach pieces then i put it back in the tin and topped it with breadcrumbs and uh you know butter and then threw that in there and uh it was it man 10 oysters rockefeller good to go rock and roll so you're giving us more ideas and content for our website so i love it i'm telling you there's all you know what brian and i we give out a lot of terrible ideas free of charge and every now and then we have one that's 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 not bad like uh we may try you know i may try and and get the 10 v hashtag started there you know oh nice you nice go. collection you got there i've got hashtag 10 v uh, uh, yeah yeah well sarah thanks so much for hanging out with us sharing some about tins like i said we've uh enjoyed it anything else you want folks to know about 10 seafood i would just say like i said give it a try and try skinless and boneless sardines and olive oil just if you love it great if you don't love it, at least you could say you tried it. Right. Give it a shot. Fair Nate. enough. Give it a shot. Just talking to you, Nate. So, yeah. Oh, I heard yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're good. Well, Sarah, <laughs> uh, Sarah Kelly is the marketing manager of Season Brand. Sarah, if folks want to find out more about Season Brand, where is going to be the best place for them to do that? Yep. So they can go to www.seasonproducts.com. And you can always find us on Amazon. We have our whole portfolio uh, listed on there. Awesome. Sounds good. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us and sharing. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care. You bet. Have a good one. Seasoned Seafood Tins. We hope that everybody hanging out here, you know, all of our beer fans are not like, what? what is this? What have I gotten into? What we mentioned beer into? a few times in there. We so. did. And the thing yeah. is, is, you know, we, we drink beer, but that's not all we do, Brian. It's all you yeah. do mostly. But uh, pretty much. Yeah. You know, but things <laughs> like that. But no, nah, man, you know, seriously. They're convenient. They're nutritious. You know, there's some good variety there. You can do some stuff with it. So it is, uh, it's good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, stuffing them in the can and roasting the can. We had a, we had a comment here that said, that's basically like stuffing and then roasting in the can. Yeah. You can roast them right there in the tin, pop the lid, put you whatever toppings you want on your smoke. You could do fish too. I've only done the oysters so far with that, but sounds interesting. Uh, you know, you could take that and, uh, Put you some butter, some diced garlic, uh, top it with some bread crumbs, throw that in the boiler, you know, put some cheese on there. I think I've seen it where they, you know, put some mozzarella or whatever, and then just bake the tin. And you can basically take uh, crusty bread or crackers or whatever and scoop right out of the tin. It's easy. I would try no that dishes, out. no dishes to clean up if you do it that way. All fishes, no dishes. That's all fishes, no dishes. And Brian, and not having dishes to clean right now for you is probably a good thing considering you're in the decrepit city of atlanta whose water Ooh. system is falling <laughs> that's apart. right Ooh. we've got 100 year old pipes that are just breaking yeah. down and the city because they've never ever worked on the pipes nobody that alive has probably ever done anything with them has no idea how to how to fix it so 
I don't know where we're at in terms of water right now, but the city it, it three or four days. I yeah. don't remember when it started. Like there's still areas where there's a boil water advisory and places that are completely without water at all. And, uh, you know, on the topic of seafood, if I ran a seafood restaurant in town, I would have a Peachtree Street catch of the day on my board as kind of a running gag right. do for it. the entirety of this thing. Because it's seriously like flowing up out of like the uh, the drainage onto the road. It's flooding places out. It's ridiculous. It, it's Are you personally cut. in the the danger zone, Brian? I am not. I'm I'm within the okay. city. The uh, I'm All outside right. of. I'm safely outside of uh, the the worst okay. part of it. Fortunately, cool. it's uh that's the one nice thing about Atlanta being so large. At least when things fail, and it's failing catastrophically in town, it is. Really it's limited apart. to a you know only a certain area. So, so bad luck for it, them. And worst of all for us is it shut down some really nice beer bars and breweries yes. and restaurants there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, actually I know that, not good for them losing business for several days because of the water. Definitely, it is, it is bad. Good. I know. I know at least that I checked Wrecking Bar. I, I'm. I have to think that some of the other ones in, in that area, maybe the Porter, who just recently yeah. o- reopened, are all probably having issues with that. This is terrible. Like it's, yeah. I can't even imagine. It's, hey, uh, you mind if I talk about beer for a minute? Is that cool with you guys? Eh, okay. Yeah, I eh, right. sure. So I want to talk about the beer I'm drinking. This La, La, La Vermontois, Vermontois Trois. Uh, this is nice, man. I tell you what, I miss the days when these types of bottles were common. You just don't see these. Mm-hmm. These aren't as cool as they, they once were. And what was the T-shirt the dude from Birds Fly South? Had Saison's not dead or something like that. Something. Yeah, I think line. something so, that affects Saison is I not forget. dead. And I believed in his shirt, but unfortunately, Birds Fly South did close. Yeah. And the Saison's, people just don't give them the love. But man, this is nice. I mean, it's got, you know, good character to it, some funk. I do get that limity finish. And again, I do not get a substantial bitterness that they're talking about. I think I may have a different definition or understanding uh, of exactly what they mean when they talk bitterness, but. Man, this is nice. And this definitely would cheese plate, flute, fruit trace, charcuterie, seacuterie board, whatever. This would go nice with some, uh, man, give me some big smoked oysters. Those Econ smoked oysters, the real nice ones. Oh, yeah, those are great. And they, you know, get some of those, put out some fish, maybe some uh, mussels, which are nice there. Some, uh, a little I pulp so, O'Brien, yeah. which I know you're Ooh. a fan of there. Dip so. Yeah, that's an yeah. octopus so for make, people who don't habla espanol. Habla tinned fish. Habla tinned fish. Yeah. De pulpo. Yeah. So that would go Big really Big fan nice of that. that. Yeah. I didn't expect to like octopus as much as I do. Yeah. That's a weird thing I've discovered about myself. It, it seems like a weird thing. Like it more than calamari, I've decided. So that's something. Okay. Yeah. You know, most yeah. of the habits I get into are probably not good ones, Brian. But I do like my tinned fish habit here because, again... I'm getting good protein. I'm getting mega threes, you know, the, the, the fish oils and all that, that it's a lot easier than, you know, cooking up a piece of fish or something. I can crack a tin open and we didn't really talk about it, it much with season, but um, I love smoked trout too. That's another oh, one. Yeah. That, and that's one that if you want to turn it into a simple salad or a simple spread, it's just, you know what, dump it in a bowl, put a pat of cream cheese in there, maybe a little bit of mayo, season it whatever way you like. And you got, you got a smoked fish dip there instantly and i saw that uh moda had m- mentioned that uh salt cod and i've, I've traveled to spain and cod yeah. is wonderful out of a tin salt cod like the appetizers and the stuff i had over there is amazing i'm like i had no idea how good cod is so shout out to cod Cod is shout great. out to cod yeah man. shout yeah, out right. to cod. big ups to good cod <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Well, Brian, you mentioned uh, in your beers of the week that you were drinking an Anchor Steam, and we have followed this story a long time. Brian, we have an update. We have an answer to what is next for Anchor Brewing. We finally do, and I'm just finishing my beer, and I can tell this is getting a little on the old side. This this bottle, this last one I have, is from February, from Valentine's Day, February okay. 14th, yeah. Valentine's Day of last year. So I can taste it. We We definitely need a fresh supply. The good news is that on his LinkedIn page, the billionaire founder of Chobani, I don't, I think, is it Chobani or Kobani? I don't know. I think it's Chobani. I think it's Chobani. Chobani yogurt. Chobani. Ham, Hamdi Yulu, Yulukaya, I think I said his name right, announced that he has purchased Anchor Brewing in its entirety, including the, the entire two acre property, the production facility, and the nearby tap room. In his announcement, he says he will honor Anchor's history 
and offer his commit and offers his commitment to its future and he plans to rebuild the brand and resume operations. Unfortunately, we don't know a thing about the sale really, but we do know that the uh, real estate alone was valued at 40 million dollars. We also don't know why it took so long for the sale to go through. According to news stories we saw earlier this year, we were supposed to know what Anchor's future was by the end of January. So this to me sounds like the best possible outcome for Anchor. We've got a new owner with the financial resources to get the brewery back on track and an appreciation for Anchor's value beyond just numbers on a spreadsheet. So I'm kind of happy and I'm celebrating with my last anchor here. With your so, anchor. Yeah. Yeah. I saw his video that he, I saw it on LinkedIn. I don't know where all he posted, but I saw his video. He was talking about buying it. And I mean, Brian, you know, with, with businessmen, you never know, is it lip service, but he seems sincere that he cared about the brand. You know, it, it does, wasn't, yeah. he wasn't just trying to dump money into something to, you know, to get, to get, you know, a cheap investment. It wasn't like buying Ballast Point for what the last company pay $75. This is something like that. For I think, and, and a few lottery tickets and a pack yeah. of smokes. Yeah, pack of smokes, yeah. right. According so. to what I read, he actually met with former uh, former employees of, of Anchor to talk about the brand and to get an okay. idea of, and he has a particular uh, appreciation for the, the history and the uniqueness of, of Anchor Steam, which is very good because that's the that's probably the most important thing that could carry on, but also I yeah. want Chris, Anchor Christmas to show up again on shelves. I, I, do. I do. You know, that. I believe, Brian, I believe I that that's going to come back because just judging by what he was saying there, you know, what how he felt about the brand and everything, I I, I believe that we will see we'll see Steam back. I don't know if it was someone, because I only saw a comment about this on the internet. I didn't see any official word, but a comment about him bringing back the old labeling, branding in that. So possible. That's, um, yeah. So we'll. I guess we'll wait and see here. He does say that he's going to honor their history. So my right. my assumption would be to go with the most historically accurate. So yeah, the Sapporo sprucing up of the of 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 anchor is probably yeah. going to be jettisoned, and I'm happy about that. Maybe so. you should have kept that bottle of steam. Maybe that will become the one that's the the rare. And and hard to find one now. That's so, possible. Yeah. Actually, yeah. come to think of it, it could be. Maybe I'll hang on to yeah. this empty. <laughs> That's right. Hold on, man. Hold on. Brian, more talks of, I mean, there's mergers, there's acquisitions, there's sales. This seemed like rumors more than anything. And Sam Adams, basically, they said they didn't comment on rumors or something like yeah. that. But um, it sounds like Suntory is in talks to buy the Sam Adams Brewery. Well, it it sounds like that. It, it sounded like that to the uh, a reputable paper like the Wall Street Journal, who did report that, or at least had a headline that they were in talks to buy Sam Adams. It turns out that that seems to be a rumor from all parties involved. A Suntory representative told Brewbound, who I just got the story from, that there is no no fact to the rumor that we are in negotiations okay. with Boston. Right, so Suntory not on board. Boston Beer said they won't talk about it, and uh, they also say it's just rumors. That no, that's why they're not going to talk about it. And apparently, uh, Jim Cook repeated that to employees during an internal meeting that it was just rumors, and they're not going to talk about it. And uh, yeah, this has happened a number of times over the year, over the years, I guess. And uh, ultimately, any sale of the company is just going to be at the, the discretion of Jim Cook, who owns all of the voting shares for Boston Beer Company, and he has previously said he has no plans to retire. And his only succession plan is to, quote, not die. So that's there that you go. Pretty, pretty firm that that's not going to Solid happen. plan there. Okay. Solid yeah. plan, man. All yeah. right. There you, you know, uh, I was wondering if you've got if you're like, we don't comment on rumors. I was like, well, if it's not true. Why not just say it's not true? But I guess if you take the stance that we don't comment on rumors, then you can hold that stance if it's true or not true. You know, it doesn't change your stance there and, you know, avoids any issues with that. So. It provides cover for if they did even yes. just float yeah. the idea, even if it was over a beer yeah. and unsanctioned. So, I yeah, it, my initial thought was, why don't you say no? But I'm like, yeah, you know. I hope j- six months from now he does a video and the first thing he does is just grab the mics and go, psych. Uh, yeah. so, so, <laughs> We're selling. We're selling the Sun <laughs> Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. So. Guys, we did some travel recently. Brian, I think you talked about yours a little bit last week. I was out, uh, as you said, on assignment, which translates to sick as a dog uh, last week. So I was out. But I went, 
I checked out a new brewery and I went over oh. and I had visited some family in Arkansas and in the part of Arkansas that I travel to, there's really never been much of anything to be honest with you. Uh, but this one um, I did get over and uh, gosh, it figures I would forget. I believe it's called native brew works. I'm trying to remember if it's native brew systems or native brew works. Native brew works in Jonesboro, Georgia. No, Jonesboro, Jonesboro Arkansas. Arkansas. Jonesboro, there is a, Arkansas. Yeah. That's it. There is a Jonesboro, Georgia as well. But anyhow, I went over there and checked that out. New place. It's interesting to see beer laws in play in different places because very interestingly, they are in a dry county. But the laws that they have there, in order to be able to serve the beer, they have to serve food. So oh. they have tacos, burgers, queso, things like that. And I just think it's so interesting because here just a few years ago, our brewers were fighting for the right to sell food. You know, mm -hmm. over there, it's a requirement. You can't do that. Now, one thing I didn't get a chance to ask about, but going out both their front door and their back door on the patio said no alcohol beyond this line, even like on their patio. So I'm wondering if that's oh. just the laws there. That's like, no, nope, you got to stay inside with it. You know, you can go hang on the patio, but you can't take a beer with you there. So I didn't get any clarification on exactly what that meant. But not only is there a new brewery there, but they're good, man. I enjoyed them. So I tried their Kolsch. I had a couple of their Kolsches, and then I had their Dunkel, and uh, that was really nice. So it's kind of cool there. That's uh, I got family over in the area, so when I do travel over there now, at least there is one brewery to go check out. The tacos were pretty good. The queso they had was some of the best I've ever had. So, nice. uh, you know, that was nice. But, uh, yeah, so that was my my adventures with my travels. Is I did get to check out a new brewery there over in Arkansas. That sounds like a delightful oasis. How many pinball machines did they have? Tim? Zero. But you know what? Uh, Hold on. Uh, I can't verify that, Brian. Where I was sitting, I looked through a doorway, and there were a couple ping pong tables back there. And I was like, oh, they've got ping pong tables. But I did not go to see if there was any pinball or anything. So, mm. you know, so I, I can't speak to the, the Schrodinger, Schrodinger's pinball at, uh, at Native Brew War. They both so, do yeah. and don't have pinball, depending on when and yeah. if you look. We could probably have Mo Mike Nate look at pinball map and find out. See if they've got <laughs> some there. But yeah, you know, really like so, Mo, I don't want to say the name wrong. It's Motahead or Motahead here. He said he's looking at the image and, and it looks really nice. It's super clean, really well done, really comfortable place. Uh, we were moving furniture and all that stuff and it was hot there and i wasn't feeling well and uh they were air conditioned they had tacos and they had beer and that's really all you can ask for in life sometimes that's that sounds fantastic yeah so yeah. shout out to native brew works over in jonesboro it was a good time exactly that's i, I love that there's a jonesboro georgia you know it's crazy how often cities are reused from one state oh, to yeah. another like yeah i I went to school in, uh, in, in fact, we've, we've talked to some breweries from that, the same town, but the same city, which I thought was un unusual, the name, I found one in Tennessee. I'm like, how, how did that happen? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's wild. Anyway. Yeah. That's thought I, I'm crazy. Amused by these there's things. like a Philadelphia, Mississippi. There's a, mm. there's a Utah, Alabama. They spell it differently, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have a Houston County in georgia spelled like houston but they pronounce it houston so who's wrong texas or or south georgia or i think it's middle georgia actually i'm i think i'm gonna go with houston on houston yeah i'm going with houston on this All i right. just I, I maybe that's just they've got the uh the advantage having been the uh the one that's the, that's better known basically people uh you know are aware of that more broadly yeah. than houston county but I guess there's a, is there a, is there a, a Houston Street in New York City? No Am one I, knows. There's really I, no way to find out. I don't know. I, I don't think it's called Houston. I, there might be something anyway. Like is it Houston up there too? Okay. Be, okay. I, I, I'm not. I'm not from New York. I don't know. I'm just yeah. making stuff up right now. <laughs> All right. All right. You know, Brian. Another thing I saw on the beer front that, um, man, I just don't chase these like I used to, and they keep coming out with them. And this one sounds good. But did you see the new KBS variant that's releasing? Oh, is that is a is it a chocolate espresso or something like that? Chocolate yeah. espresso. That sounds pretty nice for a, a KBS variant. But and uh, I think it had it. In what I read, I believe it had vanilla in it as well, which I think would be if you're going to mix chocolate and espresso, those big like big kind of 
could be bitter flavors. Having a little something like vanilla involved to take some of the edge off would be kind of a welcome addition. So yeah, yeah. it sounds it sounds it sounds good to me. If I see it, there's a good chance I'll, I'll pick it up. It uh, there's KBS is great. I mean, it's 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 good across the board. Some of the uh, the adjunct variants they've had have been a little on the sweet side, but. Uh, for whatever reason, Founders is always like kind of erred on the sweet side when it came to their stouts. Like it t- could just a little, little further than take they it, need to take it yeah. back, just a notch, just a skosh, just just a, skosh just a touch. And I think that's just uh, kind of a, a a taste preference that they have. That's uh, you know that I don't necessarily share. But yeah, yeah, I I like them sweet in small doses. You know, like we we've talked a lot about like the Southern Tier stouts. I mean, those are those are teeth crackers. They're so sweet. Mm-hmm. And and I dig them, yeah. But uh, you know, it's a small pour kind of thing. You know, it's the, the give me a four ounce pour. Even eight ounces with some of those is a little too much. Yeah. The uh, what was the one? There was a, I can't think of it, but I know there was there was also some, uh, um, French toast. There was a French toast old yeah. old bastard yeah. or whatever the heck it was called. It was super sweet. They also had the. Uh, a blueberry indulgence or something like that. They had a couple of them or one. The lizard, lizard of cause. That was yeah. one of them that was like, man, that was, that was tough. Like that was that you could put that on pancakes by itself and it would work. That was how, that was how intense it was. So madness. Yeah. Madness. Yeah. You know what? We do need to wrap up here, but we did. The format was a little different, but we absolutely positively cannot leave with giving a shout out to our sponsors here. So I want to thank Terrapin Brewery Atlanta for sponsoring the Beer Guys Radio Show. Uh, hot summer days called for cold beer and baseball. And, y'all, they've got you covered there. Truist Park Atlanta. Go see them. They're always putting new stuff on. And you know something really cool? If you do go to a Braves game, you can get a beer from Terrapin from inside the stadium. And they're going to be cheaper than a lot of those beer kiosks that you go to. And they're going to have a better variety. So check them out. If you want to have a set down, have a good time, they've got Fox Brothers Barbecue there so you can get you – some barbecue, get you a beer, set in the AC, get out of the heat, have a good time. Thank you very much to Terrapin Brewery Atlanta for sponsoring Beer Guys Radio. And since we talked a lot about seafood this week and uh, you know beer, seafood, I got to point out because of their food truck rotation, Truck and Tap frequently has the combination of beer and seafood, specifically things like lobster rolls and seared tuna and even sushi. They've got a food truck that comes around that'll do sushi for you. So if you're into that, you want to try some beers, Definitely swing by. Check out their website, though, truckandtap.com, to see when their food truck schedule is. It is posted there, so you can you can make that all happen. Uh, you know what? We've we've talked about a lot of really good beers that would go with it, but if you're looking for a few recommendations, I'll give you a few quick. I, I went lighter with most of mine. Uh, it would stock. I'd go with their Yahoo uh, Gerst Amber, which is a pre-prohibition recipe that's clean and malty. I think that would go well with a lot of different fish uh, and, and not be too offensive. At Duluth, I'm going to go with the uh, Moody Tongue Czech Pilsner. It's on a side pole, so that's that's going to be great with any fish. Alfreda location, I'm going to go with the Three Taverns Pilsen Liberation, a classic Czech Pilsner that's a collaboration with uh, Pilsner Urkel. And finally, at Truck and Tap Lawrenceville, I'm going to go, I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to go big with Bold Monk's The Way, a Belgian gold strong ale. Golden strong ale, strong golden ale. I don't know. Wait, whatever One of that those. is. One of those. I don't know if it's going to be too much for your lobster roll, but there's only one way to find out. Get it and get it and try it or just get a taster. Of it. You don't even have to order the whole thing. But uh, again, make sure you check out what's going on at truckandtap.com for the full scoop. And thank you once again to Truck and Tap for your support. Good stuff. Good stuff. Y'all, we thank you for hanging out with us this week. Really appreciate it. Go out there, get you good beer. Try some tin seafood. We promise not to stuff it down your throats every week. Well, maybe a little bit, but not like this. week. But check it out. See what you think. Let us know what you think try some pairings and see what's going on but whatever you do we hope that you have a good week and don't forget to drink local cheers